All right, welcome to Unit 3, Topic 6, which is all about fission, fusion, and the can-do nuclear reactor and nuclear energy. Uh, if you've been following through right from the very beginning, then congratulations, because you've reached the end of the course. The last topic that is covered in the course are these here. If you're just jumping around, then again, feel free to do that. Just uh, pick out the topics that you think you're having the most trouble with, and uh, that's a great way to go as well. So let's get right into this, the last topic. And first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about fission and fusion, and what they are, and what the main differences in those are. So we'll do that first, and then we'll jump right into the actual can-do reactor. Just a very, very brief overview, that's all. So first of all, nuclear fission. Well, let's go back for a second. In the last couple of sessions, we've talked about radioactive decay. Now, nuclear fission, nuclear fusion weren't mentioned in that section because they're different. There's something different altogether. Okay, so far we've learned all about radioactive decay, alpha, beta, and gamma emissions. But even though we're talking about energy being released here, the biggest particle emitted in any of these is an alpha particle. It's still very tiny. It's only a helium nucleus. And the other important thing to remember about these other radioactive decays is these are natural and spontaneous reactions. They don't need any help to occur. They occur all by themselves with no extra help. Fission and fusion, however, are not that way. Something has to happen to trigger those reactions to begin. So in the case of fission, in the case of fission, what happens is when neutrons bombard a large atom like uranium, and you can see that happening here in this little graphic, when that happens, if the neutron is moving slowly enough, it can be absorbed by that uranium nucleus, causing the nucleus to split. Okay, because now as soon as it absorbs that extra neutron, it becomes unstable. Okay, it's not terribly stable already, but when it absorbs that neutron, it becomes very unstable. It only lasts for an instant, and then it splits. Two possible products are shown here, barium and krypton. Those are not the only two possibilities. That's just one possible outcome. So this is what fission is then. A large nucleus like uranium splitting into two smaller ones like this. Now it doesn't split right in half. Okay, you notice one of these is bigger than the other, right? The barium has 54 protons and the krypton only has 36, or 56 protons, sorry, and 36 protons. So they're not exactly the same size. But it does split into two smaller ones. That's the key to fission. One large nucleus splits into two smaller ones. Fission generally occurs with large nuclei above 82. The most common one, at least the one that's used in nuclear power generation, is the uranium atom. That's the most common one. It's not the only one, but it is the uh, more common. In the process of this split, you'll notice that three more neutrons get released three more neutrons end up getting released okay, in this process. One is absorbed at the beginning, but at the end, three more get released. That's a typical fission reaction. Like I said, not the only one, but it is a very typical one. So that's what fission is, splitting one atom into two. Fusion is the exact opposite of that. But let's look a little bit more at fission first. You noticed in that, and I pointed it out, that three extra neutrons are emitted during that split. Now, under the right conditions, and i.e., if they're moving slowly enough, those three neutrons can be absorbed by three more uranium nuclei, and then each of those will split, and each will release three more neutrons. Now, that results in what we call a chain reaction. That's what a chain reaction is. So what's happening is one atom splits, one nuclei splits and gives us three neutrons. 
then those three neutrons can cause three more splits, giving us nine neutrons. Those nine can then cause nine atoms to split and give us 27 neutrons, et cetera, et cetera. And as a result of that, that can cause a whole lot of reactions to occur very, very quickly. Now, obviously, that can get out of hand very quickly, too, because then the next time there's 81 and so on and so on. So it keeps getting higher and higher and higher. So there comes a point where we have to, <coughs> excuse me, have to control this. Okay, you can't just let it go run away like that because very quickly that reaction will get out of hand. But anyway, in the blink of an eye, in an instant, <coughs> we can have billions of nuclei split, literally billions. And each time one of those splits occurs, the mass of the products, the mass of the results, are less than the mass of the reactant. The mass of this is always less, less than the mass of these. So there's a mass difference. There's some mass that goes missing. There's some mass that goes missing. And that mass difference, that mass difference, is converted into heat energy. And that heat energy can be calculated using Einstein's equation. Einstein's equation being E equals mc squared. Okay, so like I said, we call that a chain reaction. A chain reaction. All right, so let's look at fusion then. How is fusion different from fission? Well, in a way, fission is exact, or sorry, fusion is exactly the opposite of fusion. Because in fission, in fission, one large nuclei splits into two smaller ones. But in fusion, we take two small nuclei and we join them together to make one larger one. Okay, so in that way, they're opposite. But in another way, they're very much alike. They're very much alike in that they both release tremendous amounts of energy. Okay, it's an excellent energy source. Okay, all the nuclear reactors that are in existence in the world now are all fission reactors. They haven't been successful in building a fusion reactor yet. Now, they've triggered fusion reactions. The only problem is they're pretty much uncontrollable because of the tremendous amounts of heat energy released. They're very hard to contain. <coughs> so that means that we can't harness that energy. Now, it's used in nuclear weapons, in hydrogen bombs, that type of thing. But you've, you've seen pictures of the results of those things and tr the tremendous destructive power. So we haven't yet harnessed that as a way of producing energy. So how is the energy produced? Well, we've already mentioned it. The energy is produced because there's a mass difference between the reactants, or the original, and the end product, or sometimes we just call it the products. In other words, there's a mass difference in the left and right sides of that equation. And using E equals mc squared, Einstein's famous equation of relationship between mass and energy, we can actually calculate how much energy. We can actually calculate how much energy is equivalent to that amount of mass. Okay, And uh, we'll actually do some calculations like that when we look at the uh, review questions from all public exams now in the latter part of this. But just one thing to note, that fusion is what happens inside our sun. Okay, The sun produces energy, and it produces it using the power of fusion, or the process of nuclear fusion. In other words, hydrogen atoms are being joined to make helium and et cetera, et cetera, and all the other elements, most of the other lighter elements can also be produced in that same way. Okay, so fusion is what happens inside the sun. Now, let's go over, look, switch gears for a second, look at the CANDU nuclear power reactor, the CANDU reactor for short. Now, CANDU is, a, is an acronym. It's the acronym C-A-N, which stands for Canadian, D, which stands for deuterium, and U, which stands for uranium. And the significance of that, the significance of that is that it's built in Canada, 
so therefore Canadian. Deuterium tells us that deuterium, which is a part of heavy water, remember the deuterium is that isotope of hydrogen that has that neutron in the nucleus, okay, two nucleons. Okay, it uses heavy water as a moderator, and heavy water is just like ordinary water. If you look down here, here's ordinary water, H2O. Okay, here's the oxygen in the center, and here's the two hydrogen atoms, the normal hydrogen atoms that just have one proton, no neutrons. Then we got heavy water, which has deuterium. In other words, the other isotope of hydrogen, the one that has two particles in the nucleus, a proton and a neutron. So we got that extra neutron. It's called heavy water because the molar mass is actually a little bit heavier than normal water. Because a deuterium atom is almost double the mass of a regular hydrogen atom, the, the normal common isotope of hydrogen. So that's why we call it heavy water. Anyway, that's the significance of that. And the U is significant because it tells us that the fuel is uranium. Okay, that's the can-do reactor. Now, the can-do reactor is a little different than some of the reactors that are uh, in operation in the world right now. It has a number of distinguishing features that we're going to talk about in just a second. But before we do, let's look at exactly how a nuclear reactor works. Okay, now, you know, I'm, we're not going to get into a lot of detail on it, obviously, but the basic operation and construction of the nuclear power plant. And this is not just a can-do, this is any nuclear power. Any nuclear reactor has the same basic features. First of all, here's a reactor core, we'll call it. Okay, and inside this core there is a uranium fuel, right along here. There are control rods up here. There's a moderator in between, and the purpose of that moderator, remember we said that if the uranium, if the nu if, sorry, if the neutron was moving slowly enough, it could be captured by a uranium atom, a uranium nucleus. If it's moving too fast, it just zips right through, doesn't, doesn't get captured. So it has to be slowed down. So the moderator is what does that. The moderator is a solution that will actually slow down neutrons, slow down the fast moving neutrons, and in that way, those neutrons can be captured by other, other reactants, other reactions, other uh, uranium nuclei, I should say. So that's the purpose of the moderator. The control rods right here, those control rods can be inserted or removed from the reactor. Now the control rods are made of a material that absorbs neutrons. So the name suggests what they do. They control the rate of reaction. They control the rate of reaction. And that means that if we push them farther into the reactor, they'll absorb more neutrons and slow down the reaction. If we draw them back out again, then less neutrons get absorbed, more of them cause uranium nuclei to split, and the reaction speeds up again. Okay, so we can control the reaction by inserting or removing those control rods from the reactor. Now, a fission reaction produces enormous amounts of heat energy. And what happens is that heat energy heats up water, usually, and the water is kept under pressure so that it doesn't turn to steam, and that causes the water to become superheated, super hot. And then it's passed through this heat exchanger. So the super hot water in these pipes boils more water right here, creating steam. That steam is pumped through a pipe. Okay, It makes a turbine turn that's connected to a generator. Then the steam goes back through a condenser that cools it off again and recycles it to be used as water to go right through the process again. Now, it's important to note that the water here in the pink and the water here in the blue are kept separate from each other. That way, the radioactivity doesn't get into over where the turbines and stuff are. Okay. And that's what happens. That's the basic operation of any nuclear reactor, okay? any reactor at all. Now, what makes the can-do reactor special? Well, the main thing that makes it special is the types of safety features that are built in. Okay? The can-do reactor is a little unique. Number one, it's one of the only 
reactors that uses heavy water as both a coolant and a moderator. Okay, that's one of the things that makes it unique. Another thing that makes it unique is this big round device right here called a calandria, which is essentially the fuel core. That's where the fuel rods are inserted into. It's a big metal core. This thing on a typical CANDU reactor can be 40 or 50 feet in diameter. We're talking it's fairly huge, like 15 meters across. It's big. Anyway, some of the safety features in a CANDU reactor are number one, moderator dump. Okay, if this reaction for some reason starts to get out of control and they can't stop it, the first thing they would do is dump the moderator. And by dumping the moderator, okay, that means there's nothing there now to slow down the neutrons. So very quickly the reaction would stop because when the atoms split and release neutrons, those neutrons are moving very quickly. If there's nothing there to slow them down, no more reaction because they're moving too fast to be captured by other uranium atoms. If for some reason that doesn't work, they can drop the control rods. Okay, there are control rods in the, in the CANDU reactor made of cadmium metal. They absorb neutrons. So those control rods can stop the reaction as well. Now, if for some reason something jams and they can't, slug, they can't be pushed down, there's an electromagnetic clutch right here, a little clamp that as soon as the power goes off, as soon as you turn the power off to those clamps, they release the control rods and the control rods will just drop into the reactor core using gravity, okay? If something happens that, you know, it doesn't work. Now, if that doesn't work, if they can't dump the moderator and they can't drop the control rods, they can also use something called a moderator poison. In other words, they can inject a solution into the heavy water moderator and poison it. Now, what poisoning it means, they have inject a solution that is capable of absorbing neutrons. Okay? The moderator doesn't absorb neutrons, it just slows them down. So if we inject something into the moderator that can absorb neutrons, if we absorb all the neutrons, the reaction will stop. Okay? So there are three safety features here, any one of which can work, any one of which could shut down the reactor if need be. So all of these safety features together makes the CANDU reactor one of the safest in the world. And we're not saying that because we're Canadians. We're saying that because it's true. There's never been a major nuclear accident involving a CANDU reactor. They've always been able to be shut down before it ever gets to that. Okay? No major accidents ever. So that's the CANDU reactor and how it's different. Now, the other thing you should be aware of are some of the pros and cons of nuclear power in general, not just the can-do reactor, but in general, what are some of the pros and cons? Well, let's start with the cons, with the disadvantages, the bad things. Some of the bad uh, items about nuclear power are, number one, mining uranium can cause harmful materials to leach into the soil and groundwater in the environment. Okay? Uh, uranium mines are not nice things to live next to. <coughs> because there's a lot of poisonous materials that are, end up getting released because of the mining process. So that's a big disadvantage. Okay, exposure to radioactive isotopes like uranium pose health risks, cancer being one of them. <coughs> okay, radioactive materials can cause cancer, so you want to limit any exposure to them. There's no permanent and safe way to dispose of radioactive waste that forms in the reactor. Right? When this uranium breaks down, it splits, it forms radioactive isotopes that give off radiation, some of it for thousands of years. Okay? So we need some way to store it. There's no way to get rid of it. We've got to store it somewhere and try to control exposure to it so that we don't have to worry about uh, people getting sick and things like that. <coughs> so right now there's no permanent way to do it. What they typically do is bury it. They bury it underground. The next thing is very, very expensive to build a nuclear power plant. It's a very expensive thing to build. Very high capital investment. 
it takes over 20 years for a company to get their investment back on a nuclear reactor plant. Okay, so very expensive. And last but certainly not least, there's always with a nuclear plant the risk of producing nuclear energy. There's always risks associated with that. There's always the risk of an accident. And an accident at a nuclear reactor could potentially release radioactive elements, radioactive isotopes, into the environment. And that can be very harmful for many, many, many years. And that's one of the things they're fighting now over in Japan ever since the earthquake and tsunami. They're trying to get those reactors back under control. Some of them are still not back where they should be. They haven't been able to shut them down yet. Okay, so all those things are disadvantages of nuclear power. Some of the advantages, though, number one, it helps us meet increasing demands for electricity. For example, in Japan, where space is a premium, a small island with a lot of people, okay, and they have no potential there for hydro plants and things like that. Nuclear was basically one of their only options. Okay, at least they can meet their demand for energy by nuclear power. Okay, it produces huge amounts of power. <coughs> Another big advantage, at least in Canada, is uranium is fairly plentiful in Canada. In fact, Canada has some of the biggest uranium deposits anywhere in the world. So we don't have to import expensive fuels for other types of power plants. Okay, another big advantage of the CANDU reactor is it has an excellent safety record. So the idea of the risk associated with nuclear accidents is very, very small when you talk about the CANDU reactor because of all the safety features they have built in. And last, again, but not least, it's a great alternative to things like oil-fired plants or coal-fired plants or diesel-fired plants. In Newfoundland, by the way, most of the energy on the island of Newfoundland is produced by diesel plants, plants that burn diesel to turn generators to produce electricity. Okay, in Labrador, a lot of it is hydro. Right now, there's no high, there's very little hydro production on the island of Newfoundland. There is some. There's a couple of places where there are uh, hydro projects, but nothing big like on the scale of what they have in Labrador. But anyway, it's a better alternative that way because it's a green source of energy. In other words, it doesn't produce harmful greenhouse gases and things like that. If you've ever seen a picture of a smokestack at a nuclear power plant, all that's coming out of that smokestack is steam, water vapor. That's it. There's no smoke. There's nothing being burned there. No fossil fuels. So it's a clean fuel in that way. Now, yes, there is radioactive waste that comes from the fuel after it's used, but uh, that is kept out of the environment as much as possible. So there's some of the pros and cons. And now we're up to about 25 minutes, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to split this in half. We're going to stop here now, and uh, we're going to put this in two parts. And when we uh, come back with the second part, we'll look at some of the problems, some of the types of questions, I should say, that you will find on old public